Shad of Rust. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I want to talk about the forgotten medieval city of castles. Now you might be wondering, hang on, is it as a medieval city of castles? I've never heard of it. Well, that's the forgotten part. But even if you have heard of this city and know about it, there is an oversight that I feel uh, has been done to the point where people have actually not realized that these buildings of this city are most indeed castles. But even if you don't understand the castle component of this city, it is still one of the most remarkable medieval cities of all time. I'm referring to the fortified towers of medieval Bologna. Just have a look at them. This is unbelievable. In its prime, in its heyday, it is estimated that this city had between 110 to 200 fortified towers. Now, what classifies these towers as castles? That I want to get into, because understanding the more precise definition of castles, we will see that these fortified towers are actually falling into the role of what many medieval castles were like. And I want to discuss it a bit more, the role and utility of these fortified towers, also the parallels between these fortified towers and other fortified towers that are either castles or attached to castles, so we can actually see a much more distinct parallel, and also the circumstances, the amazing, unique circumstances that caused these castles to be built. It is amazing. And so much so, when you look at images and also artistic recreations of what this city looked like in its prime, it's a bit hard to realize you're looking at a medieval city. This city has often been called the medieval Man Manhattan for good reason. It's amazing. And I remember when I first saw images of this city, I thought I was looking at some type of steampunk recreation. And when I found out that, no, this is actually a real historical city, I was enamored and just entranced. I had to learn more. And also, I had to learn about this, those circumstances that caused this incredible thing. This is something that is as close to, like, fantasy as you could almost get. In actual fact, when I was looking at it, I was, it was like I was looking at a more historical depiction or or a possibility of what a, you know, real-life version of Luthadel would look like. Luthadel, if you've read the Mistborn series uh, by Brandon Sanderson, there is a fantasy uh, city called Luthadel. I believe it's Luthadel. I hope I'm getting the city name right. But he described it kind of as a city of castles, where these uh, powerful noble families would build these massive cathedral, fortified cathedral edifice castles, fortresses, as a sign of wealth, but they were made for proper use in actual conflict. And it was justified brilliantly in that book but this is almost a real-life historical parallel where these fortified towers were built by the wealthy families of this city for protection, but also for conflict. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. I, I Again, I, I'm just enamored by this thing. But before we begin, I'm very grateful to let you know that this video is sponsored by HelloFresh, something that I think many people in a medieval siege inside a castle would have loved to have had. In actual fact, it would have been so useful. We have a bit of a, a, a recreation example to show you of how it might have went if they had something like Hello Fresh in the medieval period during a castle siege. Because this is like genuinely absolutely delicious food, really easy to make, it's delivered to your doorstep. And when I say I used Hello Fresh for years, I, I'm not lying, I meant that. I used it for ages before they're ever a sponsor. You know, here are all the recipe cards that we kept because we liked it so much. We kept the recipes in case we ever wanted to remake any of the recipes. That's how great it is. It is something I can genuinely recommend wholeheartedly. And I tell you, if people in a castle siege could get access to Hello Fresh, oh my goodness, would they have loved it as well. Good show. Do you say, keep at it, lads? Yes? What is it? Quench! My lord, uh, as you know, the castle is under siege. Of course I knew that. What on earth would you bother telling me something so blatantly obvious? Because I'm the maid and the butler is away. Well, that does make sense. Do you have anything useful to say? There's no food. Oh, I already have that covered. I've ordered Hello Fresh. Should be delivered in no time. But the castle is under siege, my lord. How will they get through? It is Hello Fresh. They deliver come rain or storm, war or famine. They will get through the battlements, and we shall get not only plentiful food, but very nourishing. Ah, ah, the freshness! 
Little waste! Affordable price! Always on time! No matter the circumstance! Ah! I don't know why I'm checking my list and looking at the additional hair I have. Odd thing to do, really. Oh! oh. Your Hello Fresh has requested. Excellent! Exactly what I've been waiting for. Do you know my accent is still changing? But on that note, which is completely unrelated, I realize I have servants that need to be fed. And I can't exactly have them die of starvation. So I'll take another five orders if you can. Off you go. It's only an army of 400 men. You'll make it through. As you wish, my love. Good job. I'm sure he'll be fine. If you haven't tried HelloFresh before, now is a brilliant time because of this phenomenal deal I'm able to offer to you. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code SHADOVERSITY16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. And with some of those free meals, you'd be able to choose between 30 different dinner recipes each week. That's the most choices of any meal kit. And did you know you can even update your delivery address so you can enjoy HelloFresh at your vacation destinations with just a click? They also have a line of kid-friendly recipes for picky children eaters. And I can actually speak from experience with that because one of my younger children is extremely picky, but he genuinely loves HelloFresh. They have a range of fit and wholesome recipes that make it easy to eat well without sacrificing flavor so you can maintain your goals and still feel good about your food choices with HelloFresh. And one of the really convenient but also great aspects of HelloFresh is that they include pre-proportioned ingredients which means less prep time and also far less wasted food. So I can't recommend HelloFresh enough, it is genuinely a brilliant product and they have their brilliant deal where all you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code SHADOVERSITY16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. It really is great stuff, you will not be disappointed, and thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Alright, so let's look at this amazing castle city. And yes, it is a castle city. How can I say that? Because oftentimes people just refer to these as towers, which is true, they are towers, okay, so it's not a, a misidentification, yet it doesn't describe one of the most significant elements of these towers, and that's the fact that they are very much fortified, functional towers for actual conflict, warfare. I can tell this categorically by looking at it just by virtue of the design. You see, there, if someone wanted to build a tower, they weren't restricted to this design. So we shouldn't think that these are just fancy towers that the nobility wanted to build in the city as a statement of wealth and influence, which indeed they were. But if that was the goal, wealth, influence, but also the bragging rights of having a really tall or one of the tallest towers doesn't explain why they're fortified. Other types of towers that exist in this period are uh, belfries, for instance, so bell towers. Also gothic-like towers as well, they usually had bells in them on top of that. Watchtowers were one. Impressive edifices that were just made to, uh, you know, be eye-catching and stuff that were combined with the type of cathedrals that we see built through all throughout the medieval period. If they really wanted to build something fancy, that's what they could have built. Yet they went an additional step to give them actual military function. But the other thing that we need to consider is why just build towers in the first place? Yes, towers are eye-catching, they're big, they're tall, so it's hard to miss them. But there are other things that you can make to show a display of wealth just through really artistic stonework, statues, really amazing manners with uh, the most uh, elaborate kind of either tile work to making murals to the materials used, any number of things. And and that we've seen historically have been done as really big, you know, look at me, how how wealthy am I, statements of power and wealth, all those things. So the fact that the nobility of the city chose to build fortified towers is very significant. It means that no, these are more than just fancy, you know, towers, which is why I feel it's a little misleading to just simply call them towers, because the term tower doesn't inherently carry the fortified aspect. The term castle does, but there are many types of castles, and this is where I think people have also gotten misled as to not identify these buildings as actual castles, is because they don't generally fit the stereotypical depiction of what a medieval castle looks like if you're not too familiar with medieval castles. Because when you start to look at what many medieval castles were and how they were designed like, 
these are actually very similar to Medi a medieval donjon. Donjon is a bit of a complicated term. Originally, it was quite synonymous with the term keep, the primary fortified structure of a medieval castle. And it's quite accurate to identify these buildings as donjons. In English, the term keep arose to mean essentially the same thing. And so do you refer to one versus keep versus donjon? In the modern day, keep has been the term that has become more popularized to identify the primary fortified building. And donjon, interestingly enough, has evolved to mean the primary fortified tower, which is why even in a modern sense it's quite accurate to call these towers donjons, both in the medieval context of being a for primary fortified building, but even the modern context of being the primary fortified tower. They're towers! They're fortified! Donjon keeps, they work well. What did they call them in the medieval period? I have not been able to find. In actual fact, getting a lot of detailed information on this city and these towers are a bit difficult. I actually even had to go in to uh, video tours of the towers that had images of the informational diagrams they had inside some of these towers and then screenshot them to get some informational diagrams and even these ones I got blurry and uh, and so I wish a lot of this information was digitized but it doesn't seem like it is. So short of traveling there myself I've done my best to get some deeper information about them. Unfortunately what they actually called them in the period I can't really find out. Uh, the language of medieval Bologna most likely would have been Latin, but it had Frankish influences because the city was conquered by Charlemagne at one point, but was also then later held by the Holy Roman Empire, which is mostly medieval Germany. But for the heyday when these medieval towers were built, the city was actually independent, which is remarkable. And it got its independence through allying with a thing called the Lombard League. It did require winning a battle against Frederick Barbarossa himself, but once they won that battle, they negotiated a thing called the Peace of Constance in 1183, which was the catalyzing event that gave the city of Bologna its independence and was also the catalyzing thing that created the circumstances which rose, I caused these castles to be built. But as I was mentioning before, we see French, German, and Italian Latin influences in this position, but it should also go to tell you that this city sat in like a crossroads at once. It was the frontier outpost of the Byzantine Empire, and then the Carolingian Empire, and then the um, Holy Roman German Empire, and then it became independent as a crossroad trading hub, also a center of learning because uh, one of the earliest medieval uh, universities was built in this city, and tremendous wealth flowed through this city during this time. In terms of Bologna's useful position, which influenced its growth into a trading hub, this utility was actually compounded, increased, due to the fact that it was almost a center point for several uh, trading canals which allowed trading ships to come and go and get access to other parts uh, throughout Europe. Now, of course, they wouldn't extend to every part of Europe, but the fact that it was used as a center point for trading canals, that meant that just tremendous wealth would have flowed into this city. The occupants within the actual city center, the main part, were mostly artisans, traders, like really wealthy people. And uh, the, uh, the less wealthy people obviously wouldn't be able to afford real estate within the location, and they lived further and further on the outskirts. And not to say you wouldn't come across poor people in the city. Of course, there would have been beggars and other things. But no, the owners of property became very, very, very wealthy, and Bologna just bloomed into a trading, but also a place of education and art. There's even like dedicated museum um, showcases of just about Bologna, because there is tremendous artistic, religious, uh, just amazing things came out of this city. It was a very influential city, became very wealthy, and what's amazing about it, it was mostly independent, which, as you will see if we've not already mentioned, created one of the most unique environments in the medieval period, which therefore gave rise to uh, literally a city of castles. So did they call them towers or donjons, castles? Hard for me to be able to find, but in terms of the strict definition of what a castle is, yes, these towers most definitely filled that role, which is why it is more than justified to say this is a city 
of castles. But let's take a closer look at some of these towers so we can actually see just how fortified they really are. Unfortunately, not too many have survived to this day, although there are artistic recreations, depictions, and there are also older, uh, you know, depictions of them as well, because they didn't have a strong, a really good grasp of uh, foundations in terms of castle construction. They understood to a certain extent, but they didn't have nearly as well an extent as we do, as we have in the modern day. And as a result, a lot of these uh, castle towers that were built were not very stable and needed to be uh, dismantled to save it falling over and crushing other buildings and people because some of them reached up to 100 meters tall. Like that's crazy, but that's the tallest. On average, they were like between 30 and 50 meters, but that is still massive. But also just to point out the stability problem, one of the surviving towers of Bologna, uh, they are called the Two Towers. Uh, the smaller one you'll see has quite a significant lean to it. You've heard of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's also a result of not fully understanding having a proper foundation when you build something really, really heavy. Uh, a lot of the uh, castle towers of Bologna fell into that issue as well, as we even see with the surviving ones. But there are other surviving towers as well, but we can look at closely and get an idea of uh, some really interesting aspects to it, specifically the fortifications. But remember, the estimate number of these castle towers is so, I, I think I said 110 before, it might have been 80 to 200. It's hard to know exactly because there are different records from, from different periods, uh, referring to certain towers, and some people believe that the same tower gets counted twice when it's referenced later on in another document, and some people believe it's a different tower. But still, even if you went as low as 80, that is a crazy amount in a single medieval city. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So, one of the key features that you'll notice in the design, they're all square towers. This is somewhat indicative of the period in which they were made, which is the uh, 12th and 13th century, but it's a mistake to think that no rounded shapes were used in fortification of the past. The Romans had rounded half towers, most definitely in a lot of their fortifications. Uh, so rounded towers were used earlier than people think, but they weren't as common. That much, I believe, is true through my own you know, research and study and seems to be indicative of the towers that we see in Bologna. One of the first things that you'll notice about these towers, aside from them being square, is take a note of how many windows are on these towers. One of the key principles of medieval fortifications is that windows can be a massive weak point because it's an ent possible entry point that people can break in through. And so you avoid large windows at the very least close to ground level. And when you do see windows added to a proper, and by the way, I'm not referring to renovated castles. Castles, after they lost their military purpose and people still wanted to live in them, to make them more livable, they often added larger windows, sometimes on the bottom level to make them, you know, more livable. As I mentioned, uh, a good example is Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle is uh, s uh, such a heavily renovated castle that you wouldn't be able to call it a true fortified castle anymore because it has too many weak points. They've thrown out the uh, military application and they wanted to turn it into a palace. But if you look at a proper fortified castle of medieval period, the times in which they do have windows, they're going to be several levels off ground level at least, or at the, uh, going further, they will never have windows facing the external vulnerable sides of the castle. They can have windows facing the internal bailey, which is more secure, or they would have windows on parts of the castle that aren't meant to be fortified. Well, the uh, fortified towers of Bologna follow that exact same pattern. We do not see windows close to ground level. And then as you go up, you do see openings, but these openings aren't necessarily windows. Oh, and by the way, one of the types of windows that they would have close, while well, I was talking about large windows, but arrow slits or arrow loops are a different matter because those are defensive things to shoot through. And so, yeah, if they do have windows on vulnerable sides or close to the ground, they'll be arrow slits. Now, it, sometimes it looks like there are some arrow slits on these towers, but they could be uh, types of bracing that was added after the fact to try and strengthen them. It's hard to get really good detailed close-up images of them. I've looked at tours on the insides of these and I didn't see many arrow slits. But what I did see are large openings for windows higher up or doors. Doors facing the outside of a tower with no platform there to walk upon. Why would they have a door going to the outside? Well, the answer is that there was a platform in the past, but what type of platform would you put on 
a, a building like this. These doors are access points to external battlements on the towers. What type of battlements? We're talking about hoardings. A hoarding is a timber extension added, usually to castle walls, but also castle towers, to give people a platform to repel attackers. That's either shooting bows, crossbows, but also dropping large, heavy things or nasty things like boiled sand and stuff. It's hard to do that when you have like crenellations sitting on the wall, you have to lean out and do it. A hoarding gives you a platform to walk out of the line of the wall beneath and be able to drop right down onto the attackers beneath. One of the key signs of hoardings are these interesting square holes on the wall itself. Those holes initially are there as part of the scaffolding work and so they can put timber beams in the holes, put a, like a platform, then they can build up the stone and as the stone gets higher they make provision for a new, ho new hole, they put the timber in there and then they have a higher platform and they go up you know, successively like that. These types of holes are called potlug holes, but it's very likely that they had multiple names in different regions and different languages. But the stereotypical name in English in the modern day that we refer to them are potlug holes. And what do we see on these towers? Potlug holes all the way up. But it's not just for scaffolding, because also what you can add, thanks to these potlug holes, are wooden hoardings. One of the diagrams that I was able to find of uh, one of these towers from the inside it's a bit blurry, but what we see here is an image that shows three consecutive layers of hoardings. That is incredible. I said this is a tower that has multiple layers of battlements going up. Were they fortified? <laughs> oh yes, they were. Multiple layers of battlements. Hoarding battlements. Oh my goodness. But then of course some have crenellated tops, but also what would have been very likely is some type of wooden battlement, hoarding-like battlement, sometimes just uh, an actual building, right sitting on top of the towers themselves, which would give uh, a larger footprint because it's extended. So when you extend a, uh, a wooden structure from the line of the wall beneath, that's called jettying. You see it a lot in medieval cottage kind of architecture. I have a whole video, why do medieval buildings overhang their castle floors? Yeah, that's called jettying. And when it's done with stonework, it's called corbelling. But it's very likely that they had a jettied structure on top of these castle towers to give a larger footprint, larger room uh, for them to stay within. So by looking closer at these towers, they are without a doubt fortified for actual conflict, okay? These are made to be used as defensive structures. So it's clear these towers were built and used for defense, but that's not the only use that you could put a fortified tower to. It also meant you had a very secure place to store supplies, to store valuables, to store weapons, also soldiers. They could have functioned as a type of barracks at times as well. But of course, when, you know, conflict broke out, it's the safest place. And so the rich family that that built it most definitely would retreat to it as well. This makes a lot of sense because when we look at other medieval castles of multiple periods, we can see very close similar designs. Now, if you think a castle needs to have a wall around it to be classed as a castle, that is historically inaccurate. There are many fortified structures, buildings, that did not have a wall around them that were used and referred to as castles in the period. You could look at multiple examples. One is called the Tower House. There's a number of these represented in Scotland, but a tower house is legitimately a type of castle that does not have a wall. It is a fortified tower, and the tower can be of differing designs. Sometimes they don't look as stereotypical as you would think as towers. They look more keep-like, but they are most definitely a fortified large building tower, right? There's also peel towers, which are a type of medieval watchtower that also functions as a castle because people lived in them. And there are many cases of castles that don't have walls around them. And then when we look at some of the smaller scale castles, not only the fortified buildings, but just on their own, like, you know, certain tower houses as well, look at the designs. Some are as simple as being a square tower-like structure with a battlement on top. Look at how simple and direct that is. But it's still a castle. So if this fortified tower structure is a castle, how can you say the ones in Bologna are not? Just because they're in a city doesn't disqualify them, especially if they're functioning that fortified defensive purpose. 
So what we can see, these fortified towers of Bologna are actually very similar to many other types of castles that we see in the medieval period, but what's interesting about them is they do tend to be a little bit taller and sometimes a little bit more narrow, and because they're so tall they have multiple levels of battlements, so as a result I think this design does deserve its kind of own classification, and I'd almost class these as uh, urban style medieval castle towers. But the peculiarities of these designs mostly come from the urban environment in which they're built. They have a more narrow footprint, they were more restricted on the amount of space that they could occupy, that prevented perhaps doing an outer wall, though some of these towers have a wider base and have fortifications on that base as well, which created an additional layer of defence. But if I didn't know anything about medieval Bologna and I looked at a, you know, dense urban setting where I needed to build a fortified castle for myself and I was restricted on the footprint, this type of design is probably what you would end up naturally coming to, which is what they did as well. So, did anybody live in these fortified towers? This is one of the key distinctions of a castle, because a castle is a residence. The thing is though, you need to understand that that um, classification already has exceptions in the medieval period to buildings that were legitimately referred to as castles in the medieval period. Castles that functioned as more military fortifications to a military order, this is like the Crack de Chevalier or Marlborough Castle, are still called castles, okay? And so even in the medieval period, just fortified fortresses sometimes were referred to as castles if they were built for the purpose of defence. So a defensive structure sometimes was just called castle anyway. But in the, even in the case of Bologna, a lot of these castles did have people living in them, but other times they didn't. Uh, there is an interesting inconvenience that comes with defensive structures like this that we see reflected in other castles in the medieval period, and it's that the primary fortified tower sometimes was a bit too inconvenient to live in, especially living at the top, you'd have to climb all these stairs every day, and that's a pain. And so what we see sometimes in castle design is that they have a fortified primary tower, that can be referred to as the donjon in the period, the keep is a more common term as I mentioned in the modern day, and they wouldn't always live in it, but it would be the primary fallback point when the castle becomes under attack, especially up the top, because any attacker, not only would they need to break through any outer walls if they were there, but this next part also applies to the case of Bologna, by going to the top of it, the attackers have to then go through each level, and fighting while going up the stairs, often narrow stairs, it's very, very difficult and dangerous, and it adds a very significant fortified element to any defense position that you'd want to go to. And so, yes, oftentimes these large fortified towers, even on more stereotypical castles, weren't lived in. They were a fallback position, and then they had a more habitable part of the castle that was built on ground level that they would live in. And this, in my opinion, is where we start to see the distinction, the difference between what the keep is and what the donjon is. Donjon is a term that always stuck with the tower element of a castle. Why? Because of an additional utility that you could put this tower to. If you weren't going to live in the tower because it was so inconvenient to get to, it became a great thing to store things in, mostly the most precious things that you wanted to protect because that was the hardest place for people to get to, into and steal. But also, being so high up, it was one of the most difficult places to escape from. And so the large fortified towers of these castles started to be used as prisons. And you know what's really interesting about some of the fortified towers of Bologna throughout history? Some were used as prisons. This reality remained true in many different parts of the medieval period that a place that's really high up and hard to get to is a great place to throw someone that makes it difficult for them to escape from, okay? Yes, prisons. And this is where the term donjon evolved to mean dungeon in English. Dungeon, the place where you throw prisoners. Donjon literally evolved to mean one of the places in a castle that was most difficult for people to escape from. It started with the donjons, the most fortified towers, and evolved to just mean any place in a castle that was really hard to escape from. That includes a place buried deep in the ground, the dungeon. But that also gives insight as to why the term donjon stuck around and referred to the tower part of the castle and the habitable living part of the castle it started to be referred to as the keep. Even though a true proper keep should be fortified and oftentimes it was tower-like, we see the kind of uh, evolution of the language. Signs that the fortified towers of Bologna were lived in is that there are many cases that had multiple floors and also floors to the lower level. But there are cases of the certain towers being so narrow that they actually didn't have intermediate floors on the center of the tower going up and it was just a 
spiral staircase, a timber spiral staircase, it's square, bordering the line of the internal wall all the way up to the very top. And it would be very hard to live in such type of castle if the primary, you know, floors or rooms is at the very top and the very bottom. A tower like that would primarily be used for defensive purposes, not necessarily for habitable purposes, but we see both. We see towers that were lived in. One tower in particular that's still standing this day and actually functions as a bed and breakfast, it's the uh, Prendipate? Prendipate? Uh, I add an Italian accent to it, um, tower. It was used as a seminary at one point and a prison as a multiple levels going up and most definitely was able to function as a residence. Because these towers were built by the most wealthy families, it's likely that the wealthy families did have, you know, a uh, separate residence, maybe attached to it on, you know, a lower level. But again, many cases of them living in these towers as well. So then, what are the circumstances that would have caused these towers to be built? Because this is very like, singular, almost unique. I haven't seen any other cases of this happening. There are cases of castles being built, you know, within the cities, sometimes attached to the city walls or within the city walls. And this is literally the definition meaning of a citadel. A citadel is usually, a, or sometimes like in translation means little castle, but it means the, you know, as opposed to the city, it's a, it's a small in, in the size of the city, but it's the fortified part of the city, the citadel. And usually we only ever see one castle being built in a city. The reasons why might, you know, lead us to the cause for how Bologna came about. And it's obviously the ruler, the king of the city, the primary authority wanted a place of power to be able to govern, control, also protect the city. But the governing and control part is an interesting thing because Bologna of this time didn't have a singular ruler necessarily. It was basically a type of free city state. Though it had treaties and uh, obligations to certain nearby rulers, uh, <laughs> they had an interesting relationship with the Pope, for instance. It was mostly autonomous, and as a result, the city needed to govern itself. Who would rise to govern the city then? the most powerful and influential members of it. It would be very hard for a single member of this community to say, I'm going to build myself a fortified residence that gives me protection and gives me more influence to be able to exert my power and authority and influence on others, and I'm then going to stop you from being able to build your own castles. What's interesting is that many a leader, ruler of the medieval period did that very thing prevented the locals from building their own fortifications. This uh, arose in many instances throughout the past. One in particular of the uh, later medieval period was a thing called a license to crenellate, where there was literally a license needed if you were going to add fortifications to your residence, regardless of what that residence was. Oi, bruv, you got a license for that medieval castle fortification. If it was a, a manor, you still needed a license to add fortifications to the manor house. If it was built out of stone or something larger, like a keep or, you know, any type of uh, defensive building or any type of building, you literally needed a license to add fortifications to it, even if you were a noble, because the king wanted to keep check of how many castles the nobility had, because that gave the nobility power, not only to, you know, maintain authority over their own area, but gave them power to oppose the king. Castles were a legitimate type of military armament, and whoever had them gave them power to uh, do many, many things. And so, literally, kings and rulers tried to regulate who was able to build castles. The kings themselves, they didn't need regulation, they would build as many as they had, and they usually built multiple ones. Edward Longshanks, for instance, built several castles in Wales just to impose and maintain his power and control over that region. So yeah, kings built multiple castles, but as to nobility, well, if they're on their side, yeah, but again, they tried to regulate it. But in a situation where you, uh, there was no real overarching authority, but it was an authority maintained by a group kind of union, well then, uh, who could prevent who from building? In actual fact, I suspect that the first nobility to build a fortified tower within the city most likely was the catalyst that kicked off all the other ones building them as well. A sign of power and prestige and showing off, I think it had an aspect to it, but really the first one, it was built 
fortified. All these towers are built fortified, so that was the primary thing. They could have built any other thing to kind of show off and say, look how wealthy I, are, wealthy I am. No, 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 no. Gaining, maintain, and influence over this city became a very heated, conflicted thing that actually spilled into conflict. And so there were must have already have been tension before these towers were built. And then when one of these, you know, nobles, rich merchants in the city built a fortified tower, just think about that. That would have kicked off an arms race. It's not only really imposing, but it's threatening. If one person has one of these fortified towers, that would give them huge influence and ability to uh, potentially even lead a coup because they are, if they're the only ones with a fortified residence to strike out from and then retreat to for defense, oh my goodness. So if anyone else nearby had the means and was rich enough to be able to build their own fortified residence or fallback tower, yes, they most likely did it. And then when two did it, it's almost like a Mexican standoff where they see, oh, someone just got a really, really big stick. How can I protect against it? I need a big stick of my own. And so we see these towers, multiple, being built all throughout the city. It's remarkable. And this really is the environment, the situation that caused it. And it makes sense when we kind of break it down. In fact, during the 1200s, so the 13th century, and this kind of, it was the late 12th century and 13th century, Bologna suffered from great political instability when most of the prominent families of the city incessantly fought for control and influence and power in the town. And so the idea that these towers were just like vanity projects to show off wealth. No, 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 no. There's recorded instances of serious conflict of people trying to, as I mentioned, gain influence and leadership of the city. That's why these towers were built. They're fortified towers. They're not fancy towers. They're not, you know, um, belfries or uh, types of uh, cathedral-like towers. Many common... By the way, there were belfries. Like This depiction of the city of Bologna, which I was able to reconstruct and it was difficult to find, actually has some towers that I would more identify as bell towers. And we can tell by the types of windows and exteriors on the towers. But most of the other ones, these are fortified ones. What's also interesting is the level of infighting that happened in the city was one of the catalysts that weakened it enough for the Pope to impose rulership over it, okay? Uh, uh, the very fact that they were able to have all this infighting was the fact that they were more autonomous, but that was the very thing that led to the autonomy of the city being subverted by the Pope. He instituted a ruler in the city, uh, it was, uh, I think it's Cardinal Bertrand de Puget. I'm, I'm horrible with French pronunciation. But that happened in 1327. Of course, the inhabitants of Bologna, who seem to be a rather um, a rebellious, independent, strong-headed bunch, uh, didn't like that, and they did rebel against him as well, and he was eventually ousted. And Bologna became a signori under Tadio Pepoli? in 1334. Of course, a lot of this came crashing down uh, when the Black Death hit the city in 1348, and the estimated population of Bologna went from 40, 000, uh, 40 to 50,000 inhabitants to 20 to 25,000 inhabitants. Yeah, like, oh, the Black Death would have been devastating in Bologna. But the, uh, the golden age of this castle period of Bologna was the late 12th century and the 13th century kind of culminating and ending with the Black Death. The towers were still around, but uh, as soon as you gain more centralized authority over the town, where the uh, nobility, the uh, uh, rich families within it, couldn't really gain influence and leadership of the city, and there's no real point for actual infighting. If they did fight, the great authority would come in and stamp them down. The utility and purpose behind these fortified towers lessened as well, and they started to get dismantled bit by bit, to the point where we only have a few still standing to this day. There was also that instability issue because of the architectural technology at the time. Something else when analyzing this that caused them to try and get higher because some of the height of these towers are just immense is the fact that they're so close to other towers that 
very likely could be an enemy depending on what alliances or negotiations happen at the time. And so if you have these towers so close to one another, the tower that is taller is going to have a significant advantage over the tower that is shorter because you can shoot down onto anyone standing on the top of the tower, even battlements, you know, around. And it's much difficult, much more difficult to shoot up than it is to shoot down where you're aided by gravity. So I don't think it was just a vanity project to try and have, I uh, say, I've got the biggest tower. I think it was also a defensive element as well because having the biggest tower gave you the greatest advantage in conflict. And in some of these conflicts in Bologna, can you imagine how amazing it would be if two close by towers get into conflict and we like, <laughs> there's recorded instances of conflict breaking out of people vying for control of the city, but I haven't been able to find specific accounts of this family or this tower versus this tower, anything like that. But it's likely that this happened at one point or another. And can you imagine a type of battle between these two towers that are close to close enough to shoot at each other? It would be incredible. One of the most unique medieval psych environments I've ever seen. So unique that it's almost parallels certain fantasy depictions. It almost looks like a fantasy city. It is amazing. Literally, the medieval city of castles. Utterly incredible. Thank you very much for joining me in this big deep dive showcase of what I feel really is one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen about the medieval period. But of course, you can probably tell why I'm so interested, like a city of castles. How, how on earth have I never heard of that before? The answer is, I think people have not really identified as castles. When I was looking at a lot of them, people were just referring to them as towers that the nobility built, uh, as signs of wealth to show off that was sometimes used in conflict when no no no, no. <laughs> as we've hopefully been out established in this video and from the additional study that i've done these were built first primarily as fortified structures for conflict okay warfare internal warfare in the, inside the city because like i said they wanted to build something fancy there was so many other things that they could have built now these are first and foremost castles and it's incredible. Uh, have you heard of Medieval Bologna before? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I will very much look forward to reading them and I hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.